what is up Atlanta? What is up everybody else? This is the internet. This is not a, a non-exclusive area. So let's just have everybody in here. Let's have a little chat um, about last night's CCL game. And I brought on to join us. Um, really, my only complaint about that game last night was that it was not called by uh, our next gentleman, the voice of Atlanta United, the silky Dublin draw that is Kevin Egan. Kevin, thank you for taking the time. Yeah, what a great pleasure. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. And uh, looking forward to chatting a bit of the beautiful game with you. Absolutely, man. So just let's, let's just start where we start. What, going into last night's game, where were you, where were you at? Because I had the – I referenced so many times in my head the Houston game last year, the Houston game last year. Like, kind of like breathing into a paper bag of don't panic, Houston game last year, Houston game last year. And then I kind of went down I, – I basically went through this series of self-soothing so I went through you know, last year's fixtures and saw we won, I think, something like 18 games by more than two goals and had lost by more than two goals like three times. Don't quote me on that. But it, it, I went through trying to make myself feel better, knowing it was feasible, knowing that it was in Costa Rica, CONCACAF's weird. But how are you feeling going into it? Not great, if I'm honest, because I think there were a lot of question marks after the loss in, at Erdiano. Look, it's a new coach, it's a new playmaker, it was a different country, a new competition for Atlanta United as well. I, I figured things were going to be difficult in Costa Rica. I didn't think the team were going to go to Costa Rica and win, if I'm being honest. And I know Erdiano are having a really tricky time domestically this season. I just figured it's the first game of the season. You're going to try out George Bello. Not even try him out, he's played last season, but you're going to play George Bello in a huge game like that. 17-year-old on the same flank as the South American Player of the Year. It's an awful lot to ask of a team that you're trying out Michael Parkhurst on the right-hand side of a back three. Miles Robinson comes in as your, your anchor man, your center guy in the, in the three at the back. You're missing Darlington Nagby to start the game. There were question marks, and it didn't work out in the team's favor. However, the performance last night answered an awful lot of questions. You, you saw Parkhurst go back to the center man in the back three, which I, I think is crucial because Julian Gressel's going to tear forward. If you're going to play this system going forward, he's going to get forward. He's going to be the guy whipping in the crosses, as we saw all last season for Joseph. Michael Parkhurst on the right will probably be exposed defensively and in terms of pace uh, if he plays in that position. It could be. I mean, there's a lot of fast wingers in Major League Soccer. Michael Parkhurst is in his mid-30s. So uh, he's most comfortable, it seems, in that center role where he was remarkable last night. I thought he was very, very good. And Miles Robinson performed admirably uh, as the right-sided center back. Um, Overall, yeah, I had concerns. Frank De Boer coming in, it was his first game in charge. But this team has now lost the first game of the season in each of the three seasons that it's been part of. And it's bounced back every single time. So the team showed an emphatic performance last night to kind of shut a lot of us up. And you, know, you, t you touched on a couple of good points. Like I, that, that lineup that they put out in Costa Rica gave me some pause because – you're talking about you know, my, my, uh, Michael Parkhurst, the, the speed, the he's he's where he is a great footballer is in his head, where he can he knows where he's supposed to be, he knows where. He, so ha putting him back in the center uh, with Miles Robinson on the right and LGP on the left, I thought made way more sense, and I was more comfortable with that. Uh, and, and again, I thought Miles Robinson was fantastic. I mean, out and I mean, I think that he's one of those guys that I think has benefited a lot from being, you know, a role player or just a spot guy for a long time, seeing great players do it, learning from uh, Parkhurst, learning from those guys, you know, how to do it. Because he, he, his development has shown, you know, exponential growth in the past little bit. And I think that if he can turn into a piece of what he looked like last night, he's going to be an unbelievable value. And if you're talking about your first two draft picks being, you know, Julian Gressel, and uh, if Miles Robinson turns into what he looked like last night, I mean, that's just unbelievable because draft picks historically are just kind of a also and. So, I mean, I, I was really happy to see that along with Breck Shea, who I thought was phenomenal. Yeah, you know, I think Miles Robinson was probably damaged a little bit. I don't know about him personally, but in terms of the view from Atlanta United fans, after the July 4th game in Dallas, he came on late and Atlanta United winning by two goals to one. And there were two goals scored by Techo Akindele that one of them was confusion between Parkhurst and, and, and Miles Robinson. And uh, the other one was just so sloppy. So the, the, Miles Robinson really didn't get much of a chance after that under Tata Martino. Now, Frank De Boer, speaking with one of his assistants um, at the kit reveal, 
who said that they really like what they see from, from Miles Robinson. The one reason why I could see them trying to push maybe Miles to the center position and, and partly to the right is that they want to push the line higher than Tata had last year. Um, they want to play on the front foot, play higher, keep the ball. And with that, that leaves an awful lot of space in behind. And Miles Robinson is the quickest of those back three. Um, so I can see what they're trying to do. However, I, I feel Parkhurst, as we saw with the tackle last year that led to the opening goal in MLS Cup, he's excellent at reading the game. His sense and smell for the game is there for all to see. And when he's in that middle position, he can control the game where he's most comfortable. Uh, yeah, and I think that we'll see how it shakes out. And obviously with a different coach in a different system slightly, I know that they, you know, had made it clear that they're not trying to, bro- bro- you, know, you know, if it ain't fixed, don't, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it rather. Um, but there's obviously changes in a new coach and a new way of going about it. I mean, that, that game, I mean, what was your biggest takeaway? I mean, I think mine was, I, I thought that Breck Shea was man of the match to me. I just, more so that I just noticed him all the time. He was, I mean, not not to say that he was, you know, Miguel Almiron in any capacity, but when you watched any Atlanta game, you always saw Mick. Like, regardless of where it was, he was always there. And I kind of got that same, oh, there's Breck again. Oh, there's Breck again. Putting in good crosses, creating, you know, chances and everything like that. I mean, just I mean, shy of missing that uh, great chance he had uh, where he hit the post and went off left. I mean, I, I thought he was, you know, phenomenal. Yeah. So a few things that, that really stood out to me last night. Breck Shea, one of them. Breck Shea is still in his – he's in his – he should be at his peak right now. He's about 28 years of age. This is a guy who was a finalist for MLS MVP. He was brought to the Premier League for a reason. He, he's been capped so many times by the U.S. Men's National League for a reason. Carlos Bocanegra was his captain in the U.S. And he would have said, I like Breck Shea. I know what I can get out of Breck Shea with Atlanta United. So we all, I think, jump to conclusions that, that George Bellow is going to be the starter. When Breck Shea is a physical specimen, you look at the size of him, the pace of him, yet he's very good with the football at his feet. So I'm, I'm intrigued by that position. I think it's going to be fascinating to see how George Bellow and Breck Shea um, pan out, you know, and who, who's going to take the majority of the minutes. For me, as a betting man right now, after the kind of feeling and sensation of last night, I would think that Breck Shea could, be, could have a really good season. Um, and I saw that Jay Riddle over on Twitter said that his comeback player of the year is going to be Breck Shea. And I tend to agree. I think that could be a really good shout because if he has a good year and he plays in a ball-playing side under Frank DeBoer and he starts the majority of games and plays, I think he can score an awful lot of goals. And the reason I say that is because Barco and Pity Martinez are going to come inside. Atlanta United are very strong in there already with Remedi and uh, Darlington Nagby. So teams defending Atlanta United will, be, will go very compact. It's naturally the way teams do it. We see it a lot. We saw it last season. We saw it in the playoffs the year before when Columbus just went very, very narrow and made it really difficult for Atlanta to break them down. With that, Julian Gressel is going to get lots of space on the flank, which I love to see. Um, and then Breck Shea whips in a great ball with his left foot. And I think he'll get on the end of crosses in the same way he did in the first half last night when he should have scored. It was a Gressel cross. Think about that. A Gressel cross on the right. The man that connected with it on the left was Breck Shea from flank to flank. And he could really benefit. The other player that I'd love to touch on here is Ezekiel Barco. Um, I really thought he was marvelous last night. And a lot of people came, came back to me on Twitter when I, when I said he was superb. And they said, well... You know, he's still that half a second off, you know, completing the perfect pass. And he's this and he's that. He's not Lionel Messi. We know that. But Ezekiel Barco can be a marvelous player. And what I saw from him last night was a complete change in what we saw last season. Um, he was a bit tougher. You know, he didn't go to ground as quickly as he, as he did last season. I found it frustrating when he'd go to ground in the smallest touch and he'd stay down. And that could cost his team because referees aren't going to buy that. He was tough last night. He, he was very um, industrial. Everything he did was with great purpose. He tracked back. He helped the team. And that was a, a big concern of mine after the Costa Rica game was, how do you play in a system that includes P.T. Martinez, Joseph Martinez, and Ezekiel Barco? And how do you work defensively when those three guys are not known for their defensive capabilities? But yet you saw Barco last night tracking back, slotting in as a midfielder. Um, when he needed to defensively. But then going forward, he picked his spots great in a great way. He, he freed himself up in, in a very intelligent way, created space for himself. But it was the varying ways of attacking that impressed me. He was able to slow the game down at times, 
simple pass or a, a piercing pass through uh, to his, his teammates in the second half that we saw. But then he was also able to run at people and force defenders to track back. And in doing that, that's going to free up space for Joseph. So I, I think we're going to see a big year. And he's still only 19 years of age. He doesn't turn 20 until the end of March. This is a guy who has tremendous ability. And I think we're seeing an attitude shift from Barco that we should all be excited about. And I, I, I could not agree with you more because I think that the that price tag weighs so heavy on a player's shoulders, both personally, but then from a fan's perception of it, because you pay that money. I mean, if you buy, you know, a hundred thousand dollar car and it shows up and it's, you know, a Honda Civic, there's nothing wrong with a Honda Civic. You paid a bunch of money for it. So you're expecting something else. And I'm not saying he's that, but obviously he's growing into that. He's a kid. I mean, you're talking about an, a, the age thing on it, I think it's lost. I think there's two numbers that aren't weighed equally, the amount we paid for him and how old he is. And I think they need to be, well said. I think they need to be talked about in the same capacity. Because when we bought him, it was, the, it was the discussion of he's on a five-year deal. We are going to build him to where he needs to be and get there. It was a work in progress. And, I, and last year, especially with Miggy, I, don't, I didn't think it was a good fit with their playing styles, the way they played together. But with P.T. Martinez, I think it's a much better fit for what they do. And especially, you know, with Julian and everybody tracking the way they do, I think that he fits much better into this. And, and more than that, he's just older. He's matured. He's, I mean, you look at what he went through last year between the transfer moving, you know, the off-the-field issues personally, everything else like that. And then you add – I mean, that, that matures you pretty quickly. And then you have – a mix of guys, you know, all the you know Latin players around him who he's you know great friends with. Who some are older, some are younger, but they still have the you know ability to show him the way it needs to be done. Then add on, you know, old heads of Parkhurst and Lorenowitz who can who kind of shown him the way because you know when he was at Independiente, he was you know the guy for them and kind of they let him do what he wanted to do and he was kind of a hero here. Tata sat him down and said, "You got to earn it." And I think you saw that last night when he was just driving for a goal. You could tell how bad he wanted it all the time. I mean, and that, and that was my biggest issue with that entire game was the non-red card on him breaking away. If, if, if it was a yellow, I would have just said, okay, CONCACAF, it's CONCACAF, I'll allow it. But, the, but nothing on that I thought was pretty crazy. And But I, I thought that his drive and his – just hunger were tangible in that game. And he sacrificed himself. He knew he was going to be taken down. And that, that's a key part of that play. You know, I, it's something you see with Miguel Almiron. Think about the play for, for Newcastle. When Miguel Almiron broke through and he, he chipped up, he, he kind of dinked the keeper and he hit the post um, in his first start for Newcastle. He stepped in front of the defender. So as a player, you, you, you kind of sacrifice your body knowing, I could get taken out here. And this could be a sore one. It could be, it could be a bad injury, but I'm going to do it anyway because it's a red card for the opposition. Barco didn't check back. An awful lot of last season, we would have seen him check back, try and bring a teammate into play and slow the game down. He didn't do that yesterday. And, and, and at times when he got on the ball, he was very direct and he was very fast. And it's a part of his game that we didn't see a whole lot of last year. You know, I, I hosted El Clasico on Being Sports on Wednesday. And I'm sitting on, on set with Christian Vieri, who is one of the great strikers that we've ever seen in our game. And we're watching Vinicius Jr. And I, I found myself having this conversation with, with Bobo Vieri about Vinicius and then thinking the exact same things about Barco last night in that he is that split second away from being a really top-class player. Like a couple of his finishes last season, or sorry, last night, um, he could have had two or three goals last night in, in, in moments where he's in on goal, and if he picks his spot, maybe you know the one in the second half where he, he shoots at the keeper, maybe he picks the second post and he just gets that little bit wiser about his finishing technique. But he's close, and he's getting closer to being a top-class player. And I firmly believe and, I, and I, I, know I, I know I was probably amongst many people that maybe doubted this last season at one stage. I believe that that 15 million price tag, if that is the price tag, it's going to look very cheap soon. And I'm, I'm with you on that. And you, and you look at, I mean, Miguel Almiron right now in Newcastle. I mean, people were talking prior to him playing a game over there. The narrative was that is way too much money in, in, in England and, in, you know, in the EPL. It was, that's too much money for an MLS player. He's unproven. He's a, 
after two and a half games, all I can hear is, it's a steal. Like, can't believe we got him for that much. I mean, unbelievable. Can't believe it. Because he looks amazing. I mean, because he's just – there's you can't teach speed, and he's got – he's just so damn fast and gets in space so well. And he looks – and I think that his – success in this league in, in the EPL is going to do so much for you know Atlanta personally and their ability to you know show proof of concept but I also think the league as a whole I'm um, obviously you know Tyler Adams is doing well and I think that you know Alfonso Davies if he starts getting the minutes is going to be you know it's just it's just going to be a testament to it and show that it's not a risky proposition to pay in the 20 millions of pounds for a guy from this league because the progression of it has gotten to where it is. Yeah, you know, you know what else Miguel Almiron had, and, and, and when this transfer was, was was coming about, there were links with other teams, and, and one of the teams was Real Betis, and I thought that would be a good fit. He can set the end of Betis plays really attractive style of play, but oftentimes Betis will 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 have like seventy percent of the ball, and. I'm not sure that that's the type of team, the, the, the close control, intricate play that suits Miguel Almiron. Atlanta United played a rock and roll style of ball last year with Tata Martino, where they'd counterattack nearly through possession, where, you know, LGP would, would play it to Nagby, he'd play it back to LGP, and Parkhurst would get on the ball. And you kind of suck the opposition closer to you, and all of a sudden, Leandro Gonzalez Perez would get on the ball, and he'd play this. 40-yard switch to Julian Gressel in space. Gressel plays a quick pass to Joseph, and off we go. And that was a, a counter-attacking through possession nearly, whereas Betis wouldn't, wouldn't go that way. There was links to Spurs, who controlled an awful lot more of the ball as well. Benitez, and the way Newcastle play, I figured would absolutely suit Miguel Almiron because they're a very hard-working team. They kind of replicate what they are as a city in many ways. The city of Newcastle, the northeast of England, is a very blue collar, hard working part of the country. And you see it with Sunderland, with Middlesbrough, with Newcastle. And Miguel Almiron was always going to win over the Newcastle fans because he plays with that infectious enthusiasm. He plays with a smile on his face. But not only that, he works his socks off. He defends. Like, remember the new, remember the Red Bulls game in the playoffs last year when it was such a hard working, blue collar performance from Atlanta United. And that showed me that Tata Martino is much more of a chameleon in the way he can approach a game than we maybe gave him credit for. And he adapted in the game. And, and Miguel Almiron defended brilliantly. He had the most tackles in the game. Uh, he went to ground more than any other player in the game. And that's why I think he's going to win over the Newcastle fans. It's the perfect fit. Newcastle's the perfect club for him. And he's their exotic Paraguayan now. He's their guy that they all want to get behind. And the city love him already. And I, 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 I knew that they would because I knew he was a class player in that. But even more so than that, just him as a person, his personality, obviously the smile, the his enthusiasm, his just general kindness and everything like that. But the first game that that he got subbed on, at the Burnley game that they gave up that last second goal, he he they didn't call a foul on him where he worked his ass off to box out in that corner flag and angled over everything, and they end up getting it in a couple seconds later. But I mean, it's just, yeah, it's that work rate that is just immense. And then you add on, you know, his speed and technical ability on top of it. But it's just – he's one of those people you see play the game and you just know he would play it for free. And that's the – that oh, – come again, sorry. No, what, what I was saying, that what you just mentioned, I'm really sorry for interrupting him, was that his work rate is something that concerned me when I saw the team last week in Costa Rica. You take out Miggy. And last year's, the, the MLS Cup final, you, you would have just had Joseph say that as a player who's, who's going to lead the line and maybe he won't give you so much defensively. But last week I saw a team that had Pity and had Barco and I was concerned that all of a sudden you have three players now who defensively, you know, they're not known for it. Uh, and whereas Almiron was and in the final last year, the Alba came off the bench, Barco came off the bench. Um, and now you, you saw that from Barco last night, and that was one of the biggest things that pleased me was you saw a midi s performance from Barco in his defensive work, and that's got to be the case going forward. I mean, I think – and that was – that's kind of my concern, we, and we can actually kind of transition this into kind of the, the whole MLS season coming up because I think that was my biggest concern going into it. In addition to, you know, Frank DeBoer seeing how he's going to handle adversities here, how he's going to handle changes and 
see what he's going to put out there. And obviously after the first game in Costa Rica, I had more concerns than I did. And after last night, I have way less. But like replacing Miguel Almiron, even though you know P.T. Martinez is reigning South American player of the year and an unbelievable player, you know, soccer is not – you can't kind of baseball money ball this where you say, we, we, we lost him. We need to replace this many assists, this many goals. And cause that's what he gave us because that's just not true. There was so much more he brought to the table, you know, tracking back, playing defense, being two ways doing that. And so when you replace it with a guy like PT, who I genuinely think is a better player in the final third than Miguel was, but you're also losing some stuff on the back end that you have to replace, you know, with parts that you have. So that's my concern going in is just seeing how they replace not Miggy's offense or his numbers or anything like that. I want to see how they replace what it is that he did that didn't show up on a stat sheet. Yeah, hundred percent. And you've also got a change in style too. Complete shift in style. You bring in a guy who, who played for the you know the Dutch national team. A guy who uh, was heavily influenced by Johan Cruyff, uh, Rina Smickles as well. A guy who's played at Barcelona, uh, a, a club heavily influenced by Johan Cruyff. A guy who played with Pep Guardiola. Like, I mean, the, the change is going to be is going to be drastic if 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 it's implemented the way Frank de Boer wants to see. And it's going to it's going to mean an a lot an awful lot more of the ball. Um, and a much more patient build-up at times. Um, I, I just think, I think Pity Martinez is going to be a massive success. A massive success. The South American Player of the Year. Like, let that sink in for a second. A South American Player of the Year coming to Major League Soccer in Atlanta, Georgia. How cool is that? When you really think about that, how cool is it that Pity Martinez could have gone to Arsenal? This is a guy who plays exactly the same style of football, I, I think, as Paolo Dybala. Uh, he's part of Lionel Scaloni's Argentine national team set up right now. I just think it's a wonderful story that Atlanta United and the work that, that, that Arthur Blank and Darren Hills have done means that now P.T. Martinez sees Atlanta United as an option to go and progress his career from River Plate. And, I, mean, I, I, I think that it is an unbelievable story, and I kind of hate that it got lost in the shuffle because the rumors start – I hate it, but I love it because the and I do. And I talked about this on the you know last uh, chat I had, but it the the mere fact that those rumors started when they did shows that they had a succession plan in place far in advance, which mm-hmm. just shows that you're playing three moves ahead instead of being reactionary, which is so great from Carlos and Darren. But I, I hate that we knew about it, so it was such a you know a the worst kept secret in American soccer for the longest time. That when it happened, we it, it was just such a slow build up to that moment that when it happened, I don't think we grasped the true gravity of who that guy is. I mean, he just lifted the Copa Libertadores and scored the ceiling goal and was the number ten at River Plate, the South American Player of the Year. I mean, they, the people who went down to Costa Rica uh, when they were outside of Herediano Stadium doing that, there was a bunch of people out there to greet the bus. I think it was. Doug Robertson, whoever was traveling with them, said that, you know, they got out of the bus and there was a bunch of fans out there and they thought it was going to be Herediano fans kind of throwing stuff or do, you know, kind of cockacast South American things. And it, no, it was River Plate fans ch- just chanting you know, for P.T. Martinez, waiting for – they went into the press conference. You could hear them outside. They didn't leave. Then they waited around and got autographs. Like three, it was like a three-hour wait and they got a couple autographs from P.T. But, like, he is a global name in the real soccer world. He's not a Zlatan. He's not a Wayne Rooney who did it over there, but he is a global and a really important name. And I think that we kind of lost that due to the slow burn of the buildup to his transfer here, but it's a huge deal. True. Uh, he's a global name. However, he's someone who's now starting to come into his own, only now, he's a little bit of a late bloomer. Um, you know, I, I can't say that, you know, four years ago, I knew much about P.T. Martinez. I, I didn't. Uh, he's not someone who broke out for, for me personally, and maybe it's my own ignorance, I'm not so sure, and I'm really following the, the Copa Libertadores now because I'm commentating on it week in, week out at BN Sport, um, and I'm seeing a lot of these players, and uh, I, I should be a scout for Atlanta United at this point because I'm seeing so many tremendous players uh, representing sides, whether it be in Venezuela, Caracas, or I was doing the Caracas-Melgar game the other day, Melgar 
Peru qualifying for the group stages with some class young players. And uh, Pity Martinez is someone who's now coming into his own uh, at 25. So you're right. It's a wonderful story and Doug's story about him getting off the bus and the, the fans there. You try and tell Pity Martinez that going to a CONCACAF side or going to Mexico to play against uh, Monterey will be a difficult atmosphere. Try telling that to Pity Martinez, who, who has played against Boca Juniors in a Copa Libertadores final and, and had the rigmarole and the mess that he had to go through and then finally playing it at the Santiago Bernabeu. Try and explain that to someone like him. He's going to laugh you off. And he's a great guy to have. Think about the experience that he has from those games at the Copa Libertadores against the heated rival and the atmosphere and the tension in Buenos Aires and the build-up to that that game. There's nothing like it. I, I'm the biggest fan of El Clasico. I cannot wait to watch El Clasico tomorrow, the league meeting between Real Madrid and Barcelona. But it, they're not in the same city. And I get it. There's political tensions, massive political tensions right now with Catalonia trying to break away from Spain uh, and Barcelona uh, being the side that represent Catalonia and Real Madrid being the side that are the, the Spanish nationalists. And There's huge tensions there. But I still think it's on a different level when you compare Boca Juniors and River Plate. And Pity Martinez has been central to all of that. I mean, and, and you talk about, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think there's any atmosphere that he could ever be in that would be, I mean, I don't, even a World Cup final, it probably doesn't have as much physical tension outside of the, the city, anything like that. I mean, it's, that might have been, I mean, the, the El Clas, I mean, you know, you know the Super Classico is always, you know, the most heated, but the, the Super Classico as the final to the Copa Libertadores was the biggest one probably maybe one of the biggest games ever i mean i i okay, i mean it's just it's a real shame that it ended it's a, it's a it was a shambles it was an absolute mess and and i think for the biggest game in club football history as it was built to have, have it end the way it ended we're, we're kind of getting off topic here a little bit but that was something that was really disappointing and devastating um you you you, you know you have the likes of felipe cardenas who covers atlanta united for the athletic and from South America, and he couldn't wait. Like I was following his tweets in the build-up to the first game, and how excited someone like Felipe was for this game, and then to have it kind of tarnished and ruined the way it was was a great shame. But uh, take nothing away from what Pity Martinez did, you know, in the final and the tournament, and, and to build his name up, and then for Atlanta United to pick him off and have him commit to Atlanta United before the final was remarkable. And yeah, again, yeah, it's a, we got a little far astray there, but it kind of points to kind of what we're talking about in that so many of these guys on this team are not going to be scared by the moment or an atmosphere in this, you know, Champions League run. And obviously going to Monterey is going to be a task. Not, I mean, not for the atmosphere alone, but they're a great team. They're the only, I think they're the only team in uh, the Champions League right now who has a higher uh, transfer market value. Uh, on transfer market, there might be one. Atlanta is either second or third, I forget, but I know that they're somewhere at close to like 80 and we're at uh, 60 something. Um, so, I mean, they, they, they're a great team and that was, their stadium is gorgeous. So, how, how do you think that's going to, that the Monterey tie is going to shake out? What do you see there? I see Frank DeBoer having to, to, to make sure that he, he manages. And look, this is an area where this is a, the, the time of the season that could hurt Atlanta United, say, support or shield aspirations, um, which I don't think. When it's all said and done, I don't think any Atlanta United fan would sacrifice the CONCACAF Champions League in order to make sure that the team is in a perfect place for the Sporting Shield after you know, six, seven games into the season. I, I know that at this stage of the year, imagine playing DC United away from home, who have their new stadium, buzz of a brand new season, Wayne Rooney, and, and a talented you know, youngsters coming through like Canales. And then having to go away to Monterey and then back to league play against Cincinnati and then play Monterey and then play against Philadelphia Union on St. Patrick's Day at home. It's a really difficult start to the season. So Frank DeBoer is going to have to manage. And guys like George Bellow may say play in, in MLS play. Breck Shea may play away from home. He's going to rely on Jeff Laurentowitz, who got rested uh, last night for most of the game. Um, and the squad is deep, but it's still, not, it's still not complete in my mind. I still think there's areas like center midfield. That, um, that they're going to need to strengthen. And I think it's wonderful that Darlington Nagby, uh, that situation has been resolved, that he's, he's back and he's committed to the team. You can see it in the team photo last night, he's having fun. Um, because in, in big moments, the centre midfield 
is what can crumble quickest, I think. And when you have Remedi and Darlington Nagby there, that's a solid centre midfield. It doesn't matter who you go up against. Remedi will fight like a bulldog. Darlington Nagby will string the fence into attack as good as anybody. So I'm, I'm delighted to see them there. I think that the depth is going to be tested really early. and The legs are going to be tested really early. It's going to be a tough start to the season. And if they can get through Monterey, they can beat anybody. I think that it's, it's the, the depth that the team has right now and – I've, it's always been such a, you know, you, know you, you talk about it in a good way. Most of the time, from a fan's perspective, you say, we have depth, that's good. You know, we have – but inside a locker room, if you, have, I mean, if you want to tell me that Tito Vialba does not want to be starting every single game and being out there and you're frustrated, then you'd be lying to yourself. Like, he wants to be out there. Jeff wants to be out there. So, I think there's, there's – Bad parts to this season in that it's this first part is so condensed and so trying. But for those guys who just cr- crave that starting time, crave that ability to be out there, I think that it's un- I think it's going to be really good for them to be able to get that run for you know Bella to be able to play you know in MLS ties and then you know throw him you know throw um, uh, Breck Shea out there for some more experience that he has for against Monterey. Everyone's going to get a chance to show it not on a practice field. They're going to get a chance to show it in real games. So by the time that we get to the end of this, we'll have a better sense of what that depth is, who those guys are, and where they all fit together. Yeah, and they've got to get through, through this grueling period. It, look what happened to Toronto FC last season, destroyed by the start of the year. And they didn't. They had injuries at key moments, obviously, for a lot of their players. Um, but the, the CONCACAF Champions League can weigh on you if you're not ready for it. So you, you, you lean on players like Florentin Pogba who've come in. You lean on maybe even an Anderson Osiedu, um in midfield to play certain key minutes maybe in MLS. Um, you lean on Romario Williams further forward and absolutely Tito Vialba, who I think, having won a Copa Libertadores with San Lorenzo, there's a guy again who's got major experience and he's a different look altogether. So maybe away from home against Monterey, you sit Barco for a little while and you play Vialba because you know that Monterey at home are going to control an awful lot of the ball and Vialba has just got this excellent electric um, you know, counter-attacking ability. So it's, it's how Frank DeBoer manages. It's going to be really intriguing for all of us to see, but it's a position I think every single one of us wants to be in as fans of the team. I mean, for, and for those of uh, us, you know, obviously you, you are you know, being in sports following, you know, the football all around the world, kind of the you know ins and outs and all. So, what what do we need to know for those who aren't overly familiar with Monterey? Like I I know they're good. I know they are a really good team in Liga MX. I know they pretty much always have been. I know they have a one of the most beautiful stadiums, at least from if you take a picture of it from the outside looking at the mountains, it's gorgeous. But what do we need to know about that team going into that time? Where where can they hurt us? Where are they vulnerable? What should Atlanta try to do to, you know, get a result or hold something, you know, in Monterey? I'll be absolutely honest with you, Jeb. I, I don't know. And that's the truth of it. I, I, I'm covering co- right now the Copa Libertadores, La Liga, uh, on the extra show. We cover every, every league. We try to. Uh, and, but right now, Monterey and, and Liga MX is a league that I haven't had a chance to dive into yet. So it's an area that I'm going to focus on now that Atlanta United have, have progressed from uh, the Herediano clash. And, and tr- really try and hone in on Monterey. But right now, my, my education on, on Liga MX this season is relatively poor. All right, well, I, I just I think that we should just score more goals than they score. I, I don't know anything about them either. Let's just leave it at that. Keep it simple. Um, so, I mean, going, going forward into this, into this year, what, what would you consider successful? Because we set the ball really high, winning the MLS Cup in our second year. Um, so you, our, our barrier for the, what would be considered a success has lifted, you know, pretty significantly. So obviously winning the Champions League would, if, if we didn't win a single MLS game and won the Champions League, everyone would be fine. But so where, where is your barrier for I can leave this season and say this, this was good? Anything short of beating Lionel Messi in Barcelona in a Club World Cup final in December is an absolute failure. Just joking. And it's reasonable. Anything, I'm, I'm, it's, it's reasonable, yeah. It's, uh, it's an interesting season. I don't know what success should be. I think, I think advancing in, in, the, in the CONCACAF Champions League past Erdiano was a big success to start the year for Frank de Boer. I think trying to, to retain MLS Cup 
um, is very difficult, but certainly Atlanta United can, can have that within, uh, within their goals. And, and making sure that you bring through younger players from the academy, making sure George Bello uh, is an example to younger players that they can break through. Andrew Carlton, hopefully, uh, can, can mature as a player and really break through and, and, and become a real pro on the field that you see Andrew Carlton advance and tactically, he's very astute, and, and you know you see him develop under Frank de Boer. There's an awful lot of other good young players um, that are on the fringes right now, and it's 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 cool to see the connection between ATL UTD two and the first team. Um, and I just hope I hope to see a development with Atlanta United. This is only the third season. I hope to see class players from afar at the end of the season say, "I want to follow Pity Martinez to Atlanta United. Look at what Atlanta United has done for him." Um, I want to see a bigger year from Ezekiel Barco, and I want to see it. I want to see a success for Frank De Boer. I think Frank De Boer is a signing for the future as well. And um, Tata Martino, throughout all his career, will stay at teams two, three years. We knew that going in. Whereas Frank De Boer, he had a rough time at both Crystal Palace and Inter Milan, but before that, won back to back to back to back championships with Ajax. Um, and I think that if, if it's a success, Frank De Boer can try and build something special with Atlanta United. And I think that's. That's important for the club to try and build a bit of a dynasty with an identity of how the team wants to play is very important. And obviously throw in a bit of success along the way. that will be welcome. And you kind of touched on a part talking about, you know, the perception of it. So guys say, I want to be like PT. I want to go that direction. So you, you work, you know, at being sports with, you know, you, you get to talk to Rick Hudson all the time. So jealous on that. Um, so they, when you talk about Atlanta United to people who are great footballers all over the world or at you know cover football everywhere, what is their perception of it? What are they saying? Because obviously we're looking at it and you know we could not be more excited. We could not think we can do no wrong in our eyes, and we think we're doing awesome. But what what is their perception when they look at it from you know down in Florida or across the pond, whatever it is? What are you seeing the reactions to it being? So we had a poll at BN Sports about six months ago, I would say. What are the top five coolest teams in world football? Cool. So whether it be you know, a winning mentality on the field, cool kits, uh, a cool stadium, the fan base, the celebrity factor, everything about that. And Atlanta United made the top five. Uh, I believe Atlanta United finished third, if I'm not mistaken, in that. Number one was PSG, and, and most people voted on PSG, not because being sports is owned by uh, the owners of PSG. It was more because you, you look at how cool they are on the field with Neymar and Mbappe. You see Leonardo DiCaprio and Beyonce in the crowd in Paris watching the games, the city that they're in, the kits with the Jordan swag. Um, everything about that team is pretty cool right now. Uh, but, but Atlanta United was right there amongst the, the other teams included were let me see. It was the U.S. Women's National Team was in the top five. Atlanta United. Who else was in the top? I forget now off, off the top of my head. But Atlanta United has impressed so many, and a lot of my colleagues are very jealous that I've been a, somewhat a part of the journey uh, along the way. And even though I only did five games the first season, to see it grow from Bobby Dodd and to see now this team be so electrifying at Mercedes-Benz Stadium and big boys there, you know, and you've got the coolest celebrities hammering the spike and the movement before the games, the fan base, the chants, the owner and Arthur Blank telling the fans, you own the club. I'm not the owner. You own it. The coolest owner in sports. Seriously. I mean, you look at Major League Soccer, the amount of fan bases that are, are disconnected from their owner and that you have an absentee owner oftentimes. It's not the case with Atlanta, and I just love Arthur Blank for everything he's done with this team. Uh, Darren Eels connects with the fans better than any president in Major League Soccer. They've, they've had a home run in pretty much every single way, and what that does is it makes Atlanta United fans want more and want more and want more all the time, uh, which is a good thing because it'll keep the ownership and, and the leaders on their toes an awful lot. So I, I, I just think it's... It's, a, it's, a, it's an incredible story, and I, I feel such an honor and privilege to be part of it. And we are honored and privileged to be and to have you be a part of our games and our calls and everything. Because honestly, you put me in such a, a conundrum because I, I want the exposure, and I love when we get the nationally televised games because I think it's good for the brand. But I hate that I don't get to see you and Dan and Julian call the games because I, pref I very much prefer it. 
but I wish there was, you know, a way I could, y'all could just call it from a couch somewhere and I could try to sync it up when y'all do the international game, just that's an idea for, you can, you can pitch that out and see how that goes. Uh, I think there's probably some uh, rights <laughs> issues there and some other stuff, but I, uh, I would just say you do such an amazing job and you've connected so well with the fans and with, you know, the, just from your famous calls to, I mean, of, of your calls, we you know, Peach from the Paraguayan and everything. What, what's, what is your favorite thing that you've gotten that you said on a call or what's, what's something that you, you think resonates the most? So that, that one I th- is special just because it was at Bobby Dodd. It was the only game I called at Bobby Dodd and it was on my birthday and it was the debut for Andrew Carlton who came on at 16 years of age and he was re- he was he came into the game for Miggy and Miguel Almiron leaves Bobby Dodd. Like I, I have chills right now even thinking about that moment. Because it was, there was the weather delay and everybody stayed and it was, what, an hour and a half after it should have kicked off. It eventually kicks off. The fans are incredible. The audio went on the national anthem and the fans took over. Seriously, I have chills even thinking about that right now. And Gargan said it to me. He pressed his cough button. We've got like a cough button in there with our, our microphones. And he, he said, I have chills. I miss playing so much right now. I want to be on that field. And uh, it was such a fun, cool moment. And, and the one from this past season is unquestionably Joseph Martinez equalizer, equalizing the record, 27 goals. Um, held by Roy Lasseter, Chris Wondolowski, and Bradley Ray Phillips. And, and I actually had... In the build-up to the game, Gargan said to me, and we often talk about these things, you know, whether it's walking from the hotel across the pitch or uh, just maybe, you know, having a coffee that morning. You know, we'll talk about moments that may happen in the game, and I love working with Dan. Uh, he's a great guy to work with. He's a friend uh, now. He's like a brother on the road. We, we, we can, you know, slag each other, make fun of each other all the time, and he's got a unique perspective of the game that I feed off. And I think he feeds off me in other ways too. And I want to make him better. He wants to make me better. We want to grow as a tandem. And uh, Gillian as well has been a, such a cool addition. She's such a lovely person. And she's growing in her role too. And um, she absolutely loves it and feels such a huge connection. But the, the call, I'm blabbering here a little bit. The call was Joseph's 27th goal against Columbus. And it was because I think I had a goal call pretty much for Hurst in case that moment happened. And I thought, you have to have something. It's such a special moment at home. You know, if he doesn't score two, he's going to break it against Orlando next week and it's going to be away from home. You're not going to have the atmosphere that you'll have at Mercedes-Benz. So have something prepared. And in the end, I just lost it. And I, I didn't even think about the goal call I had prepared at all. And Gressel wins the ball back. Gets it to Joseph, who had options. You know, he had the option of Julian running to his to his left, I believe, and instead he just takes it on his left foot and uses the defender um, Jonathan Mensa as his reference point and bends it around Zach Steffen. And all I said was, um, I screamed Martinez, and luckily I didn't lose my voice, and I just said, "27 goal record, the Venezuelan has it," and it was the crowd that made it. Let's be honest. It was the crowd. It was the moment. Everything about that. And I was so proud when I watched it back because I thought, you didn't butcher it. You didn't butcher it. You didn't butcher it. You didn't butcher it. And that was the biggest fear at the moment was I just lost it. And Gargan kind of smiled and laughed at me as I was screaming Martinez because it was such a fun, cool moment to witness and be part of at Mercedes-Benz. And that's one of those things that, like, I, I, was, I was actually going to ask you that. Uh, later. It was like, how often do you have something – you know, pre because obviously with the with the build up of you know Joseph going, he was going to break the record. It was pretty. It was just a matter of time. I mean, like you said, you had that in the back pocket. Like, how often do you have something that you know that you want to say, and how often in the heat of the moment does that get you know just tossed out just due to sheer emotion? It's all the time. You, you can prepare for things. There, there's, you know, if you're doing your research, you, you'll probably you should probably prepare for you know you you use maybe 10 percent of what you prepare for um maybe even less and in the heat of the moment it all depends on the storylines and this is one thing that i'm always you know we talk with dan an awful lot about we have a producer on fox sports south eric kendall who's a fan of the team he knows the game he's so well buttoned up he's an excellent producer and our director tom hewitt's top class as well very experienced guy so 
we, we discuss the storylines and, and, and how the game might play out, but we don't know. So you need to be prepared for every eventuality within a game. And there's certain times that things can stump us. Um, and that's only natural. You know, I, I had a moment when I was commentating for the Chicago Fire that just threw me. It was, it was a moment where Lloyd Sam for the New York Red Bulls put the ball down and walked away. Next thing, Sasha Kleshton goes over to take the corner and he starts running the ball in. And everyone in the whole stadium is confused by it and he crosses it and uh, a defender for the Red Bulls at the time put it in the back of the net and Chicago Fire players were protesting. The referee looked confused and the, the, the rule had changed anyway a, lot, a while back that if you just touch the ball and if you say, so he, Lloyd Sam had said to the linesman, I'm going to touch it. And the linesman said, sure. So he had wait, the whistle went he just touched the ball as he was walking away. It didn't need to leave the quadrant at all. But it, there, there are things that happen in the game sometimes that stump you. And it doesn't matter how experienced you are or how green you are. It'll happen. And it, I suppose it's just how you react to it. Um, but we're learning every single day. And certainly with Dan and Jill and, and our team of Fox Sports South, we're, we're learning on the job, but we're, we're loving every single second of it. And is there – I mean, there's obviously pressure in calling a game and – I mean, making sure, like you're talking, like you said, that fear of butchering, you know, Joseph's moment and things like that. I mean, I, th- some of these moments they happen and they're so huge. I for- I was watching the uh, a while back the Manchester City uh, like uh, ninety to twenty or whatever that one they did about they had it from three they had it from the media perspective, the players, the fans, and they had the media. The, the I forget who was on the call. It's going to incredibly famous um, uh, commentator. But the one who had the Martin Tyler, yes, uh, I, my, I think it was Martin Tyler. Just with the Aguero, you know, drink it in. You'll never see anything else like this. You'll, and like people came up to him and they were like, "Did you have that rehearsed?" He was like, "How the hell could I have known that was going to happen?" And he was like, "I just yeah. I've spent he goes I've spent so many days thinking back and being so thankful that I did not screw that up because if." A moment like that has an audio track uh, that just doesn't match the magnitude of that moment. It just doesn't have that same – because what he did and ended up doing was perfect. So, I mean, in so many of the moments that you've done have that, is there a sense of fear that something is going to happen amazing and you're just going to say, good job, or just something? No, I'd be lying if I said there wasn't a sense of fear. Um, You know, uh, Kate – Murray, who I work with at BN Sports, always jokes about how play-by-play would be her worst nightmare um, because there's, there's an awful lot that can happen in the game. That you, maybe you're focusing on one thing and you miss something out of, your, out of your picture. And like I said, being prepared for every single eventuality, it's such a fun job. And I, I've, Gus Johnson, I listened to a podcast with Gus Johnson, and he spoke about how it's the greatest job on the planet because you're right there in the best seat in the house watching the game at whatever stadium you might end up at, witnessing history doesn't matter what happens in the game, it's history. And you get to tell the story of what happens. Now, it's on you not to butcher that. And it's also on you, and it's on me as Atlanta United's play-by-play voice for television, to not make it about me. And that's why, that's why with Joseph's goal, I think I was happy with myself because it was just Martinez, 27-goal record, the Venezuelan has it, lay out. Let the crowd do the rest. And I didn't do some sort of rehearsed goal call. And it was a valuable lesson for me that sometimes just shut up layout let the crowd take over and don't make the moment about a commentator it should never be about a commentator and, and martin tyler nailed the aguero um goal call and that's what makes commentators that's what makes the likes of martin tyler arlo white is wonderful sometimes you hear jp della camera and he'll just all he might say is in a real sharp way go and, and he'll lay out and it's effective and it works. It's television. People can see what's going on. Now, the, the flip side of that is you get radio, which is a completely different medium. And you're in your car and you're driving home. You listen to Jason and Mike. And they're wonderful. They capture the imagination of what's going on. And I love Mike Conti's an excellent, excellent play-by-play guy. And Jason breaks the game down on radio in the most wonderful way where you can picture what's going on. Uh, and those two are, are, are the A-team. They're, they're absolutely brilliant. And it's a completely different job. Doing play-by-play for radio and TV, completely different things. And I just before we kind of wrap up here, I just wanted to say, I mean, there, 
there are voices that you that you hear in your life. Growing up in Atlanta, I remember driving in the car and you'd hear you know, Skip Carey calling Braves games at night, and I'd be you know falling asleep in the back on some long road trip, and it just a, a voice resonates to a moment or a memory or things like that. And there's so many memories that you know your voice brings up in so many fans, and just as a you know thank you for everything that you do and the great work you do. And we're so glad that you're continuing on. And we just, we hope that uh, we get less national TV games. So you get to be on all of them. You know what? It's a, thank you so much. That is way too kind of you. I really appreciate it. And, and it means the world, but the, the more national TV games we get, it means the team's doing well. And it means that everybody's showing up at Mercedes-Benz Stadium because those networks are fighting over Atlanta, Georgia right now. They want to be in Atlanta, Georgia. They want to be at Mercedes-Benz Stadium. They want to get as many games as possible. ESPN and Fox, Univision, they, if they could be at Mercedes-Benz Stadium every week, they would. Um, so the more, the more success we have, the more national TV games. Unfortunately, it means less games for me, but I'm, I'm happy with that as long as the team's doing well. Well, it, not necessarily. See, here's, here's my pitch. We, we, the, the fan base threw an uproar and we got stars on all the kits. Now we can have another secondary rising and just get Dan Gargan to, and Dan Gargan and uh, Julian and you to call all of the national TV games for ESPN. We will pick it out front of uh, ESPN studios and make it happen. I would love that. That'd be class. <laughs> We're always open to doing those national games. That's for sure. Well, it's, it's when it, when it, Heats up a little bit. We'll try. It's a, it's a little bit cold in Bristol right now for 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 picketing. So let's we'll, we'll let we'll, we'll let the weather sort itself out, and then we'll we'll get something together. But um, Look. Jenny, thank you so so much for your time. I cannot appreciate it. I so look forward to the season ahead and the many great calls to come. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Much appreciated, Jeb. Thank you guys so much. And remember, pop up to uh, the AT&T Perch. It's where we have our pregame show. Our first broadcast of the season is on St. Patrick's Day. It's Sunday, March 17th at home against the Philadelphia Union. So pop up. Our pregame show is always 30 minutes before the assigned time for kickoff. And uh, yeah, come say hi and, and, and join the fun up there. It's always a good laugh. It's kind of got that college game day feel now where a lot of, a lot of the, the fans of the team that are in, city, sitting in the area They'll surround the set, and it's great fun. The build-up to our pregame show it just helps us bring energy. Um, so we really appreciate it and can't wait to see as many of you fans out there as possible this season. Well, thank you so much. Go see the man before the game. Get you a college game day sign of whoever. It could be the Will Johnson screen face. That was lovely. I think a couple – I mean, we can't never have too many of those. We had a sign at WrestleMania um, that, that made the round. So – do what you got to do, but uh, go see the man in person, and we look forward to the year to come. Thanks again, and we'll, as always, good talk. See you out there, and join us next time.